Good morning, Orville Baptist Church. Good morning. So good to see everyone this morning. This is a special day this morning. It's Mother's Day, and, and we have reason to celebrate today because of our mothers. And we also have reason to celebrate because of our salvation. So would you stand this morning as we sing, I Will Celebrate. <laughs> Somebody said, yes, great. <laughs> On the uh, communion table here in the front are some white roses that represent uh, a remembering of all the mothers who couldn't be here today. Maybe they've passed on. Maybe they're just out of the area. Maybe for some reason they're just not with you right now. And so uh, we want to remember them this morning as we remember our mothers we also have had a tradition here to be able to remember some specific mothers, and we do this um, every year. And so we're going to find out who the oldest mother who is with us this morning. So our, if you are 70 years old or older, will you please stand? <laughs> All right, we got a few. All right, good, good, good. 75 or older, remain standing. 80 years older, 80 years old or older, remain standing. 81, remain standing. 82, remain standing. 83, remain standing. 84, remain standing. 85, Terry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> happy Mother's Day. I am so sorry. Grace, you're right here in front of me. I, I told Linda last night, I said, I think Grace won this last year. All right, she may win it again. All right. How old are you, Terry? Do you mind saying? 85. 85. You did win, Grace. All right, let's give these ladies a round of applause. You are so welcome. 
Now we want to see which mom has her children here with her that has traveled the farthest to be here today. So if you traveled more than 15 miles to be with your mom today, will you stand up? <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> All right. Nobody drove over 15? Anybody drive over 10 miles to come see your mom? Oh, come on, people. There, there you go. <laughs> Sherry, congratulations. <laughs> Thanks for being here. All right, I have one more, uh, one more category, but no more gifts, so I, you have to trust me in this, okay? <laughs> this famous IOU. <laughs> yeah, that famous IOU. Here it is. We want to recognize the newest mother uh, at church. So if you have a son or a daughter that is three years old or younger, please stand. There's Amanda. Is Jenny in nursery? Oh. <laughs> All right, two years old and younger. Remain standing. All right, one year old and younger. Remain standing. All right, I just happen to know that Axel is like a year and three weeks. 13 months old, okay? And how old is April? All right. Congratulations. <laughs> I don't mind. Look how gracious she is. Very nice. A mother helping a mother. I like that. Well, we want, to, we want to honor all the moms and to say thank you for all you've done. You make more of an impact than maybe you'll ever realize in the lives of your children. And still to today, if you're a mother here today and your children are here, you're still impacting them in their life. No matter if they're adults and grown and out of the house, you're still making an impact as God has designed it to be. So today, the scripture tells us every day that we're to honor our father and mother, but today is a special day to be able to honor moms. So one last time, if you're a mom here today, will you stand up? And everybody give them a round of applause. All right, let me pray for you real quick. Father God, I thank you for moms. I thank you, Lord, for your wisdom to be able to bring together a, a man and a woman and make them husband and wife and tell them to be fruitful and to multiply. And Lord, we're here today because of your great design and plan. Thank you for each mom that's here today. May they feel special. May they feel honored in this day and in the days to come. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right. Thank you so much. We'll continue with worship. Won't you stand with us as we sing, My Jesus, I Love Thee.
one of my favorite Snoopy cartoons is where Snoopy's out in the woods with all these little bird scouts. And he's telling all the little bird scouts, he says, there's a special call that we have if you get in trouble. And they say, what is it? Snoopy says, Mom! <laughs> <laughs> so we always, we always holler for Mom when we're in trouble. Um, moms are special. And one of the most special things a mom can do for her child is to pray for her child. And I know all of you are, all of you all are praying moms. Um, so I want to honor moms this morning with this song called Mama's Knee. I love to sit on mama's knees when I was just a child. There I learned so many things that carried me through life. She told me about Jesus and how he died for me. She taught me many scriptures I still quote from memory. When I climb down to run and play as children always do, she got down on those same knees and prayed till she prayed through. When she bows before the throne, holy angels spread their wings when mama prays. She knows how to pray. When she lifts her voice to heaven, mama always takes the time to mention me. I'm so glad she prays for me. God knows where I'd be without the battles that were won on Mama's knees. She always keeps her Bible close by her side. Many pages are tear-stained, many verses underlined. those promises when she kneels to pray and when my world falls apart she helps me keep the faith I've seen her tears of sorrow for loved ones bound by sin until they come back to God she'll be on her knees again Takes the time to mention 
about the battles that were won on Mama's knee. Thank you to all the praying moms out there. We couldn't do it without your prayers. Won't you stand with us as we sing Jesus, Lord, to me. job this morning praise team good job Jim the special Mother's Day song all right I have something in my hand how many people believe I have something in my hand? Raise your hand. All right. About half of you. Good. <laughs> Linda, I don't think we're going to get to borrow $20 from very many people in this room. All right. Ready? I didn't lie to you. I got two hands. Okay? 
I've got two hands, all right? Last week I put a pin on its end here. You're going to figure it out before long. We're going through a thing on faith, okay? I got something in my hand. How many people believe I got something in my hand? All right. Numbers going up. But I need a little help. Brother John, can you help me? Sure. All right. Will you stand up, please? This is a man of integrity, like few others I know. I'm going to show this to you. Do I have something in my hand? Yes. If you believe I have something in my hand, raise your hand. All right, get in there. <laughs> Brother John, what do I have in my hand? A red car. A red car. Do you believe I have a red car in my hand? Raise your hand. Some of them are still holding out, Brother John. I'm sorry. <laughs> they, they don't trust me or you very much. Okay, isn't that something? All right. <laughs> take names all right now how many people believe I have a red car in my hand raise your hand you're wrong you do not believe I have a red car in my hand you know I have a red car in my hand because today's message is faith is seeing what we are believing what we do not see all right well, let's look at the scripture 11 chapter of Hebrews faith is seeing is believing what we do not see so if you have that passage or even if you don't would you please stand as we honor the reading of God's word Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was made out of what was not made, rather, out of what is visible. All right? Got that? Seeing through eyes of faith. That's the blessing of God's faith. You may be seated. So this morning we're going to ask that question, what is godly faith? What is godly faith? It tells us not in a definition form, but really the outworking of what faith is. It is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you do not see. Paul would write, who hopes for what they already have? You only hope for that which you do not have or that you do not see. And so... In this passage of scripture, we're going to see that the guiding principle of a Christian's life is faith. But this concept of faith has so many different, so many different definitions, so many different groups of people claim to have faith. So maybe it's easier for me to tell you what faith is not before I tell you what faith is. First of all, faith is not positive thinking. There's a lot of that going around and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's not biblical faith. Faith is not a hunch that someone follows. We follow the Holy Spirit of God, not a hunch. Faith is not hoping for the best. I just hope this works out. That's not faith. Faith, according to the Bible, is a human response to a divine revelation. God revealing something to us and then our response in obedience to his revelation. It is trusting God who has revealed himself in his word. He has revealed himself in his word and so therefore we trust him. It is taking God at his word. God said it, 
I believe it. The most important thing about faith is not faith itself. It is the subject of what one's faith is in. So true biblical faith has God as its object, not you and me. You see, we'd be a little crazy to speak to God or to talk to God and tell him what we want him to do. That is not faith either. So many Christians get discouraged in their Christian walk because they, they do not see God confirming what they want him to do. Faith takes God at his word, not God taking us at our word. We're not to conform he is not to conform to us, we're to conform to him. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says this, For we walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 4, 18 says, So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is is eternal. A couple of weeks ago, Norma was in my office, and I said to her, Norma, I, uh, I bought something uh, and put it on the church card. I bought, a, I bought a, a copier for my office. I said, the copier I've had for a number of years, and it's, it's, it's printing like every other line bold, and I don't even bold it. And then it's got this fuzzy, blurry stuff around the letters. And so I showed her a piece, of, a piece of paper that shows the example, as though I wanted to not get in trouble for buying a printer. <laughs> <clears throat> so I handed it to her, and she looked at it, and she said, I, I can't see it. So I said, well, well I, I walked over. I said, well, I can see it. So I went around my desk, back around my desk to the, to the drawer and pulled out a drawer and I pulled this magnifying glass out. I took it over to her and I said, here, look at this. Now can you see it? She says, no, I can't see it. I believe you, but I can't see it. And then I just started laughing out loud. She thought I was nuts. <clears throat> I just started laughing out loud. I said, oh no. It's my eyes, and I, and I just bought a copier. <laughs> I can't see right. But anyway, she said, I have seen it in the past. But it is not seeing something, but yet believing the one that said it. As we saw this morning, sometimes believing each other is hard. Sometimes believing God is a little hard. But that is what godly faith is. There's so much I don't know about my salvation, but I know my Savior. There is a song that I uh, like, that I have on the board that's coming up. It's entitled, I Know Whom I Have Believed. And here are the words. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he had made known nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. Isn't that something you don't know? And here's the chorus. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Next verse. I know not how this saving faith to me he did impart nor how believing in his word wrought peace within my heart. I know not how the spirit moves, convincing men of sin, revealing Jesus through the word, creating faith in him. That is what God has done to those who are in Christ today. He has created faith in you. 
Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says that the faith that we use to believe in God was not even our own faith. It is a faith from God. So that he has graciously given us eyes to open up to see our sinfulness and then gives us the faith to be able to believe. What a great and awesome God we serve. Second one is this. Godly faith receives his approval. This is what the ancients were commended for. They were commended for their faith. And if we're to keep in mind this passage of Scripture, we need to know what has come before. We saw last week in an overview that the letter writer to these Hebrew Christians was writing to them because they are tempted to leave the faith. They're under great persecution. Nero and the Romans are, are devastating Christians. And they are so afraid and they think, hey, it may be better if we go back to the law, go back to Judaism, because they're not killing the Jews. They're only killing us Christians. And the writer here of Hebrews says, don't go back. Don't go back. How could they make it through without abandoning their faith? And abandon it on top of that for a faith that would never save them. They might escape some immediate danger, but their souls would suffer the fate of those who reject the gospel. So our writer calls for the kind of faith that perseveres, that perseveres the soul through the most demanding of circumstances. God did not promise a life of ease. He promised to be with us in everything that we go through. Look here at Hebrews chapter 11 and go over to verse 6. We'll see it in a couple of weeks. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. It's impossible. Hebrews 11 says, it's impossible to please God without faith. And so as he's writing here to these Jewish Christians who are about or considering leaving the faith, he has gone through and he's told them, this Jesus whom you serve is greater than all the angels. This Jesus that you have served and is the savior of your life is greater than the great Moses. And he is greater than all the Levites and the priest and his sacrifice that he gave on the cross is far better than all the sacrifices of all the lambs and of all the goats and of all the bulls that have ever been put together. That is who you serve. And he's saying, now, here's what faith is. And he's about to give them 16, I believe, 16 different people of faith. And one after another, he commends these ancients beforehand, older people, he commends them for their faith in Scripture. Hebrews chapter 11 is called the Hall of Faith. And so we're going to take some time in the next number of weeks to be able to go through a number of these and to look at them and see why God commended them for their faith. Moms and dads, you are the most important teachers that you're kids will ever have. There has never been a more important time in life for you to be able to teach them the truths of God's word than right now. There once was a time when the educational system would come alongside the family and encourage and teach what the family was already teaching. But that is not today. 
the educational system does not teach reading, writing, and arithmetic. They teach the theories, gender theory, critical race theory, evolutionary theory. And we, as main teachers in their lives, I tell you what, there's never been a time when I have been a stronger advocate for homeschooling and Christian schools than I am right now. And I hope things turn around. I really do. But God is telling moms and dads, you who are here in the church, that his approval and his rewards come when we seek after him. In this passage of scripture, it says, because anyone who comes to God must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. The words earnestly seek him really is translated to walk alongside. Those who walk alongside, walking with God in this life, walking according to his path, walking along his way, he rewards us as we go. There is a great reward that's coming one day, but there is a reward in this life when we choose to seek after God's way in the way in which we parent as moms and dads. Point number three. Godly faith understands creation. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. The fact that the author of Hebrews begins verse 3, the first of the by faith, by showing an example that God is the creator of all things, is significant. It is showing us that he is the creator of the world and it is foundational to knowing who God is. The first verse in the Bible hits squarely on this fact. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You can't begin to under, understand yourself. You can't begin to understand other people. You can't begin to understand history or even God if you reject the early chapters of the book of Genesis. Genesis 1 through 11 are foundational to the rest of Scripture. And if you can't hold on to those in faith, you're going to have trouble holding on to the rest of the Bible. The first verse of Genesis presents us with a critical choice. If God created everything that is, then he is a sovereign over the whole universe. If he's the creator, he is in charge. If you do not come to him, in faith as your savior you will stand before him one day in terror as his as your judge but when you believe his word about salvation you gain an understanding about the origins of all the ages and it makes everything else in history fall into place but there are some people that do not accept this in faith not all Christians accept this, Genesis chapter 1, in faith. It's because they have some pastors that teach that this is not to be taught in faith. One such is Adam Hamilton, a pastor of a mainline denomination in our country, of which we have a church of that denomination in our city. Reverend Hamilton writes this about the creation account. So people ask me, do you have to read the Bible literally? 
I answer that, uh, the, and the answer to that sort of hinges on what part you're reading. Interesting, isn't it? So when you read, you go to the beginning and you read the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Those are stories that are representative stories. They're not really trying to tell, the, tell us the story of some ancient people who lived millennia or even hundreds of thousands of years ago. They're trying to tell us about ourselves. And so in these stories, we don't see them and read them as literal. We read the truth of them, the representative stories, and we are also Adam and Eve. Interesting, isn't it? If you miss that, Reverend writes, and you try and read this as history, you will fail to understand the real importance of the text is to tell us about ourselves. And then you've missed the truth of those stories. Really. That is the word of man. This is the word of God. Psalm 33, 6 and verse 9. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And by the breath of his mouth, all their host. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Those are the words of God. In creation, we believe what we have not seen. And we know that God has created all things, even though we weren't there, he was there, right? We weren't with him in the beginning. So it's by faith that all the promises of God have been made that are ours, even though we have not seen them all yet it's easier for me to believe that God spoke creation into being with a word out of nothing more than it is for me to believe the accounts of evolution scripture says that he spoke out of things that were not seen. There's a Greek word for that. It's called ex nihilo. It means he spoke out of nothing. There was nothing and he spoke and then there was. There was no big bang because in order for there to be a big bang, there had to be something to be able to bang together. And if you talk to scientists or look them up, they will tell you we have no idea where the Big Bang came from. Do you think it might be natural for them to be able to think that maybe there was no Big Bang at all? Maybe there was a voice of a God who spoke it and it came into being. See, science, if we've learned anything in the last couple of years, it is not exact, right? Science can't tell me how the universe began. Science can't tell me how human history is going to end. Science can't tell me what is wrong with human life. And boy, do we know what's going on out there. There is some that's just wrong. Science can't tell me what happens after I die. Science can't tell me even what I'm here for. But the Bible can. It answers every one of those questions. And allows me and allows you to be able to know this God who has created all things because he has made us for his glory. Scientists like to talk about how big the universe is. 
and how hard it is for me and you to be able to believe. It's mind-boggling, they'll tell us. It's difficult to understand. One astronomer, you might recognize his name, his name is Carl Sagan. He is known for saying that there's more stars in the universe than there is sand on all the seashores in the world. Okay, Carl, let me ask you, how'd you figure that one out? Who counted all the sand on all the seashores? And who counted all the stars in the sky to make sure that you are saying it correctly? Did somebody count them? Apparently so. They put this as the number of stars in the universe. 70 sextillion stars. I wonder what they were thinking about when they came up with that term. <clears throat> 21 zeros, 70 at the front. My question is, why is it not 60 or why is it not 80? How'd you come up with 70? That's an awful lot of zeros. How do you know that? And they want us to believe that that is the, the thing. So if you go out and you say, hey, you know how many stars there are in the sky? There's 70 sextillion. That's what Carl Sagan said. Somebody said, if you hear it three times, you begin to believe it. You know, our sun is a star, and it's surrounded by nine planets. I think it's nine. It could be eight now. They change it every once in a while. The star and the planets cluster together in what we call a solar system. Clusters of solar systems are called galaxies. And our galaxy is the Milky Way galaxy, right? Right? It's widely believed among scientists that there are 200 billion solar systems in the Milky Way galaxy. 200 billion. It's an easy count. I think I'll do that this afternoon. But on top of that, researchers have pegged that the observable universe, that which can be tangibly seen, has 150 billion galaxies. 200 billion solar systems in the Milky Way galaxy, and now there's 150 billion galaxies. If they could prove that to me and show that to me, you know what I'd say? That is one great God. Look at what he's done. You know, the Big Bang still is shrouded in mystery, but have you heard about the Big Crunch or the Big R.I.P., Rest in Peace? It's the end of everything. It's the end of everything theory that says the universe is going to keep going and expanding and will eventually table, table, taper off and give way to gravity. In other words, all the mass in the universe will be drawn together into ever smaller space until it all exists in one unimaginably dense and hot point and then gets wiped out. Well, that's a wonderful thought to think. They wrote in that thing, sounds unpleasant, sure, but hey, it probably won't happen for a few quadrillion years. Here's the truth. God has made creation. And the good news is that one day he is going to take away the curse that has been put upon creation. All of his creation in the, in the third chapter of Genesis was cursed because sin was chosen over him. So he brought a curse upon Eve, he brought a curse upon Adam, but he also brought a curse upon the ground. And he brought a curse upon the earth. Romans chapter 8, 
says that this curse involved everything. That we're under the curse and all creation groans like a woman in labor groaning that these people, these followers of Christ will be liberated one day and that he will come back and establish his perfect earth and his perfect heaven like it once was. Until then, faith is not a leap in the dark. Faith is trusting in God because God said it. Do you know the reason why I believe in creation? It's because God told me so. I have something in my hand. Do you believe me? I have something in my hand. Do you believe God? Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for faith even when we cannot see. Because the scripture says that we are sure of what we hope for. We hope for the day when you are coming back. We hope for the day that we'll spend eternity with you. We hope for the day that we will be seen as righteous and will not struggle with sin any longer. We hope for eternity in a perfect place called heaven. We hope to be able to see moms who have gone on before us and to be able to enjoy their company. We hope for the things and we're assured of them and we're certain of what we do not yet see. There is a God who loves us who is ruling and reigning from the throne room of heaven. And he is sovereign over all. And today, he is receiving people into his family who will humbly submit themselves to his lordship, who will believe with their heart that Jesus Christ, the one that God sent to save us from our sins, is the one who died on the cross for our our sins and that he arose from the dead and that he ascended back into heaven and that he's coming back again to bring all those who have placed their trust in him home we do not see today Lord but we believe because you have given us the faith. Father, today, may you grant faith to many people across this globe and maybe in this room. Grant faith to a mom or to a child. I can't think of a better Mother's Day gift than a child to give their hearts to Christ today. And they could do so by leaving where they're at and just coming and sharing that with me just saying, I want to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And Lord, the scripture says that man looks at the outside of a person and judges, but you look at the heart and know. And so Lord, work in our hearts today, I pray for your glory. In Jesus' name. Thanks for watching. Abraham Lincoln once said, All that I am or ever hope to be, I owe to my angel mom. What a remarkable quote from a president of the United States. But what is maybe unknown is that his mother, Nancy Lincoln, passed away when Abraham was nine years old. And that tells us what kind of influence and impact that a mom makes on our children.
And so I hope that today is a day that they will rise and call you blessed and that they will uh, sing praises of yours as well. Look forward to being with you again next Sunday. And until then, happy Mother's Day.